Continuing with Njal's saga, Morth, the treacherous cousin of Gunnar that we've met before, continues to be jealous of Hoskul Throne's son, the adopted son of Njal that Njal has made a Gothi. And he decides that he needs to eliminate Hoskul Throne's son because now that Hoskul Throne's son is a Gothi, many of Morth's followers have transferred their allegiance to Hoskul. He decides that one way he can do this with the advice of his father, Valgarth, who's an unrepentant pagan now that Iceland is converted, is to try to create uh, dissension and hatred, try to reactivate the anger that the Njal sons have against Throwen, Hoskuld's father. So first he tries to get Hoskuld Throwenson to hate the Njal sons. He tells him all kinds of false stories like, don't you remember when you were walking to the woods with Skarpheden and an axe fell out of his cloak? He meant to kill you with that. And of course, Hoskull Thronson, being a good-natured man, says, no, I think you're lying. I think that Scarpheden is a good friend of mine and that he was just carrying the axe to go cut wood. So this doesn't work on Hoskull, but then he goes to the Njal sons and says the same things. Actually, sometimes in ludicrous reversal, like he'll tell Scarpheden, don't you remember when you were walking to the woods to go chop wood with uh, Hoskull and an axe fell out of your cloak? Well, he meant to kill you with that axe. But this actually works on Scarpheden. And so eventually, after much of this goading and giving the uh, Njal sons many gifts, which Njal suspects um, Morth cannot mean anything good by, uh, the Njal sons, Scarpheden, Grim, Helgi, and of course their brother in law, Cory, are convinced to go kill Hoskull Throwenson. Together with Morth, so in a party of five, they go to Hoskull Throwenson's farm, wait for him in the early morning, and when he gets up to go and sow his field, they each uh, approach him and kill him, with each one of them delivering a fatal wound. Uh, Hoskull Thronson dies in the same saintly way he lived, saying, May God, uh, what is, how does he put it? May God forgive me, or may God save me and forgive you. Some, something along those lines. He, he, he begs God's forgiveness rather than cursing these men, uh, which is just a sign of his saintliness. Uh, all right, well, his wife, Hildegun, of course, finds her husband's body in the field and takes from him a cloak that had been given to him by her uh, uncle, Flosi, who had arranged her marriage to him. The cloak is now, of course, covered with blood, which will be important later. Morth tells the Njal sons that he has a plan. He will act like he had no idea about the murder, and he will prosecute them for the murder. Then, when... He reveals in court that he was, in fact, one of the murderers. He then gets to say, case dismissed, because I am one of the murderers prosecuting the case, so case invalidated. There's a lot of loopholes in uh, medieval Icelandic law, at least as it's presented in the sagas. So, sure enough, Flosi is going to be the man who is going to uh, uh, sort of lead the opposition to the Njal sons now. And as he's although he hires more as the attorney to prosecute the case. As he is traveling to the All Thing in the summer, he stops at the farm of Holskuld Thronson and sees his niece Hildegun there. She serves him a good meal, but continues to, to try to, to, to whet him, to edge him, to goad him, incite him into getting blood revenge for Holskuld Thronson rather than uh, seeking legal remedies. And... Uh, Flossie resists, uttering uh, the famous formula that women's words are often cold. And after he's resisted her incitement for some time, she throws the bloody cloak that Flossie had given uh, Hoskuld onto Flossie's back and tells him that, you know, he might want that back. At this point, Flossie's face turns white as snow and red as blood and then blue as hell, and you can tell that this has reached him. They get to the all thing, Morth pulls his little trick during the case, and the case is invalidated, but Flosi and Njol decide that they want to seek reparation nonetheless. They appoint some arbitrators, including the famous Snorri the Gothi, to decide how much Njol's side needs to pay Flosi's side, and they agree on an enormous amount, six times the usual compensation offered for a, uh, a slain man. Of course, no one has that much money. Njol puts in a lot of it, but then uh, some of the arbitrators themselves and other visitors to the court pile up this pile of money so that no one will have been compensated so much as Hoskuld, and this will discourage people from killing people like him in the future. 
Felicity comes up, counts the money, and is satisfied with the amount, it seems. But Njol has thrown a robe onto this pile of money. And for some reason, it's, it's never exactly clear to a modern audience, or, and, and that includes me, uh, Flossy is offended by the robe. Maybe because it's a unisex garment, so Njol is not giving him something that's specifically a man's clothes, so perhaps making some kind of insult against Flossy, who's already on edge because of Hiltigan's goading. But he says, who gave me this, this robe? And no one will speak up. And finally, Scarpeden says, who do you think gave you the robe? And Flossy says, I think it might have been your dad, that old beardless one. Scarpeden says, well, and he says, no one can even tell if he's a man or a woman. Again, maybe this is in reference to the unisex nature of a robe. Scarpeden says, well, you can tell he's a man because he's had sons with his wife. But here, here's something you might find more useful. And Scarpeden throws a pair of blue pants onto the pile of money. And Flossy says, well, why would I need this? And Scarpeden says, well, you'll need it if it's true that the troll at Svinafell, Flossy's farm, uses you as a woman every ninth night. This is actually a, uh, a, 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 this insult is seen in other places in the sagas and uh, is actually specifically forbidden in some medieval uh, Scandinavian law codes to say that a man is used by a troll as a woman every ninth night. At any rate, Flossie is now too offended. He pushes the pile of money away and decides he will accept nothing but blood vengeance. He accumulates a team of 100 men. That probably means 120 since we're on a uh, base 12 system with hundreds and thousands in Old Norse. And some weeks later, appears at Njal's farm with these men ready to burn the farm down and kill Njal and his sons. Njal and sons watch as these men approach, and Skarpe then wants to stand and fight outside the house, figuring that they have the home field advantage and can uh, fight off uh, this larger force um, because, of course, they're more motivated to defend their homes and lives. But Njal says they need to go inside. Skarpeden says he doesn't think that's a good idea, but Njal says, well, you know, when you were younger, you used to take my advice and you did better. Now that I'm old, you don't respect me anymore. Skarpeden seeds and they go into the house. Now these men approach the house, um, state their intention to kill all the men in it, but Flossie allows all of the uh, women and children to leave. As they are doing so, uh, one of Njal's sons, Helgi, who is stated to be shorter than the others, uh, puts on women's clothes in an attempt to escape after um, his brother Grim's wife has encouraged him to try this. So he goes out in women's clothes, but Flossie notices the unusually broad-shouldered woman has her attacked, and of course, Helgi throws off the women's clothes, fights uh, in defense of his life, but he's cut down. Now Flossie says that he's, he'd be happy to let Njal and Berkthor out, but Njal says he's too old to avenge his sons if he survives them, and Berkthor says that she was married very young to Njal, and she will not leave him when they're old. One more person has stayed inside the house uh, who, was, who would have been allowed to leave. Kori's son, Thor, who seems to be nine-ish, ten-ish years old, uh, says to his grandparents, well, you told me that you would never go anywhere without me. And so he stays inside, and y'all covers him and Thor and Beric Thor over with a uh, steer hide as the house is set aflame. Well, Skarpethen, uh, Grim, and Kori are going to offer some resistance to the men outside, throwing stuff at them and things like that. But uh, Grim is finally killed. He comes to the fire. And at one point, a, a beam from the roof falls in. And Scarpeth and Corey see that this may be an opportunity to get out. They can run up uh, the beam, uh, jump through the, the sort of hole in the smoke at the top, and escape under cover of the smoke. They do a little bit of you first, you first. Uh, but Corey finally. Uh, jumps, uh, runs up the fallen beam, jumps out, uh, but then the beam collapses, so Scarpe then loses the opportunity. And as Corey runs out under cover of smoke, one of the burners says, there I think there was a man running away in the smoke, and another one says, no, that was just Scarpe then throwing a burning uh, piece of wood at us. And of course, they have no clue how right they are, because Corey will avenge 
the deaths of his family in the burning. And that will be our concluding chapter in this recap of Nyal's saga, which I will do in my next video. For now, from beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you all the best.